power of the word, I want us to be able to go back and take a look at what the word has, what the Lord has been telling us throughout this particular study. So I'll be doing a quick overview of what we have seen so far in this particular study. In our first installment, we talked about the universal problem of the tongue. We said every man has a challenge of controlling their tongue. The Bible talks about the challenge of controlling our tongue. And not only that, it also talks about the connection of the tongue and the direction of our lives. In other words, how you use your tongue will determine the direction in which your life will go. If, we're like, if you want your life to begin to show the promises of the Almighty God, you will use your tongue to declare the promise of the Almighty God. Also, we saw in our first installment the uncontrollable, uh, uncontrollable nature of the tongue. In verse number 8 of James chapter 3, the Bible makes us to understand that man has successfully controlled every living being on the face of the earth. But for some reason, man has not been able to tame the tongue. And the reason is because the tongue is evil, the tongue is full of deceit, and the tongue has the ability to be able to bless and to curse at the same time. So man has had difficulty controlling the tongue. And finally, in our first installment, we talked about the power and the danger of the uncontrolled tongue. We said that the tongue, when it is not controlled and when it is not restrained, is a very deadly member of the body. When the tongue is uncontrolled and undisciplined, it has a way of creating problems for us. When the tongue is uncontrolled, it has, a de it has a tendency or the potential to take us to where we do not want to go. And in our second installment, we talked about the fact that there's a need for us to be able to control that tongue. And we said the first way to control the tongue is to be able to fill the heart of men with the word of God. We said the best way to control the tongue is to fill the heart with the word of God. And by doing so, we said, how do you do that? You take heed to the word of God. And that is Psalm 119, reading from verse number 9. We say, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. In other words, to control the tongue, you need to fill the heart with the word of God. Number two, to control the tongue. We need not to wander away from the word of God. In other words, you use the word of God as a parameter, as a guideline, as a guardrail for your life. Number three, in order for us to be able to control the tongue, we need to be able to learn to speak the word of God. To learn to speak the word of God. The Bible says, with my lips I have declared all the all thy judgment, all the judgments of your mouth. And then number four, we said the way to be able, the way to be able to, you know, to control the tongue is to delight ourselves in the word of God. In other words, let there be some kind of joy that comes to your heart when you are reading the word of God. Not reading it as if you have been punished. Not reading it as if it's a burden, but reading it with delight. And so this evening, as we continue to examine the way to control and to tame our tongue, we are going to be looking at another strategy for controlling the tongue. Now we are going to be talking about taming the tongue through the power of faith. Taming the tongue through the power of faith. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We are going to start reading from verse number 1. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse number 1. It says, brethren, let my, uh, my heart desire and prayer for God, uh, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, for they have been ignorant of God's righteousness, seek to establish their own righteousness, and have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of all the law. Or for, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ from the dead. But what does he say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believed on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jews and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich 
to all who call upon him. For whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we go into our conversation this evening as to the strategy for taming the tongue, I want us to quickly take a look at what we have read in the passage of scriptures of the book of Romans chapter 1, reading from verse number 1 to number 13. And the first thing I want you to notice there is Paul's desire and prayer for Israel. Paul's desire and prayer for Israel. Look at verse number 1. The Bible tells us that it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. In other words, Paul is saying, I want my people to enjoy the saving grace. I want my people to be connected back to the Almighty God. I don't want Israel to have a pseudo relationship with God. I want Israel to have a true relationship with the Almighty God. I want them to be able to enjoy that fellowship that God has made available through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why does Israel, why does Paul want Israel saved? If you look at verse number two, the Bible tells us there, he said he wanted Israel to be saved because Israel has a zeal for the Almighty God. They desire to know God. They have this particular asso- they have this particular desire in their heart to be associated with God. Now, the question that comes in: If Israel is zealous for God, why are they not saved? Look at verse number two again. The Bible says, "For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge." Which means you might desire to do something. You might desire to, to, uh, to achieve something. You might desire a relationship with the Almighty God. But if you do not know how to do it, your desire is one thing. The reality you are going to expect or you are going to experience is another thing. Israel desired to know the Lord. But for some reason, they are not able to enjoy fellowship with the Lord because they do not do it according to knowledge. They are ignorant of how to build or forge a relationship with the Almighty God. They don't know how to approach or associate with the Almighty God the way God himself wants them to understand it. And so the second thing we'll see in the passage of Scripture that we read is the, the first one is that Paul's desire for Israel to be saved. The second one we see now is the place of knowledge in our relationship with the Almighty God. God does not want you to follow him just because, he, you know, just because somebody told you. He wants us to have a relationship with him based on knowledge. And that is what Paul the Apostle is trying to make us to understand in that verse number two. He's saying the place of knowledge in our relationship with God. Go back to that verse number two again. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse number two, the Bible says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. In other words, Because they don't know how to relate with God. Because they are ignorant about what the standard of relationship looks like. What the parameters that God has set in place. The things that God has established as this is the way I want to be be approached. Because they don't know, the Bible says that they have created their own means of interaction. They created their own standards. They created their own way of getting in touch with the Almighty God. And unfortunately, because they created it, the Bible says that they have zeal. They have that particular desire to be able to know the Lord. Yes, that particular zeal is there. Yes, everybody recognizes that that the the children of Israel want to continue to have that relationship with the Almighty God. But But they don't know how to go about it. They are going about it the wrong way. They are trying to approach God based on their own standard. And why is that? The Bible tells us because they are ignorant. They don't know. So sometimes when they say that what you don't know cannot hurt you, what you don't know sometimes can hurt you because because these guys have not understood that Christ is the only way that God has made available because they rejected that way and they don't know they have forfeited that thing that they are zealous for. So you see, from the verse, our relationship with God is a function of our knowledge of Him. The more you know Him, the easier it is to relate with Him. The more you know Him, the easier it is to be able to please Him. The more you know Him, the easier it becomes for you to be able to walk with Him. The more you know God, the more you enjoy fellowship with Him. The third thing I want you to notice in the passage of Scripture that we read is the place of faith in our walk with the Lord. The place of faith in our walk with the Lord. Look at verse number 4. Verse number 4, the Bible says that, For Christ is the end of the law of for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
In other words, Paul is introducing the concept of faith as a means of forging a relationship. He's introducing the concept of faith as a means of forging a relationship with the Almighty God. He's saying the relationship with God that Israel desperately wanted to have with God can only be achieved through faith. That is the door that they are missing. That is that missing link that they do not understand. That is what they do not know. He's saying, if you want to have that relationship with the Almighty God, I know you are zealous. I know you want to have it. I know your desire to be able to know the Lord Almighty. But the way to do it is not what you're doing. The way to do it is through faith in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying, the only way to connect with God is through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, Israel missed that part. Unfortunately for Israel, Israel got it wrong. And because they got it wrong, they established a system that God did not really care for. But Paul is saying, righteousness with God, right standing with God, being properly aligned with God, forging a relationship with the Almighty God is a function of you believing in the Lord Jesus Christ that, Christ, that the Almighty God has made available for us through the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And Paul went on to develop that particular thought. If you start reading from verse number 4, all the way to verse number 7, he starts talking about, he compared that relationship with what Moses said and what Christ himself has accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary. Now, beginning from verse number 8, Paul then explained how faith is developed and how faith works. If you start reading from verse number 8, the fourth thing you now see is the relationship between our faith and the spoken word. The relationship between what we believe and the words that come out of our mouth. Let's start reading from verse number 8. The Bible tells us Romans chapter eight, reading, sorry, Romans chapter 10, reading from verse number 8. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, Paul is saying, faith in God does not depend upon your ability to be righteous. It is not a function of what you do. It is a function of what God has done for you. Faith is a function of what, of, 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 faith is a function of you accepting what God has said, accepting the way that he has made available for you. Okay? Paul is saying, salvation, therefore, is a function of you believing what God has said and confessing it. Okay? Believing that God has said that. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Then you say in your heart you believe and in your mouth you confess. That's basically what Paul is saying. He says, salvation is a function of you believing and confessing. It's a function of you accepting what God has said and repeating exactly what God has said. It's a function of acting upon what God has said. That's basically what this whole concept of salvation. That's why Paul is trying to connect what you are, what is going on in your heart and what comes out of your mouth. And so in verse number 10, Paul now connects the faith and the spoken word. In verse number 10, he said, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, your heart believes something. Your mouth declares what you believe. If your heart does not believe it, it is extremely difficult for your mouth to say what your heart does not believe. So he's saying, for us to be able to see that there is a connection between what you are saying, what you have inside your heart, and what you are saying, he said the heart must first of all believe it for the mouth to say it. If the heart does not believe it, the mouth will not be able to declare. Which means that it is not enough for you to accept the validity of a proposition by, by heart. It is not enough for you to have a mental assent to the word of God. Yeah, 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 I believe in God. The Bible tells us that Satan himself believes and even trembles. So the fact that I say I believe does not mean that you truly believe. Because what you have in your heart and what you have in your mouth must correspond. There has to be a correlation. We must declare and speak out what our heart believes. We must declare what our heart holds dear for it to manifest in our life. And so Paul says, with your heart, you believe, but with your mouth, you make the confession. So our mouth is what connects our faith to the reality that you experience. And that is why when we come to church and we pray, 
and we said that the Lord Almighty is going to heal you. The Lord is going to deliver. The Lord is going to provide. If you don't believe it, it will be very difficult for you to say, I am healed. But if you believe it, but you don't say anything, people are there, what happened? You say, well, I know I believe, I, I believe, I, I, I know I believe, I know God has healed me. But you are not saying anything. You find that it becomes very difficult to you for you to see the manifestation of what you think you believe. And so, Paul is saying, both of them walk hand in hand. Our mouth is what connects our faith with the reality that we are expecting. Okay? Our mouth is the bridge that connects what we believe and we're within our heart with the reality that we experience on a daily basis. And that's why I will tell you, make sure you do not make a negative confession. Make sure you don't make a negative declaration. Make sure you don't say something contrary to yourself, contrary to your children, contrary to your family. The reason is because the word that comes out of your mouth, they produce the reality that you experience. Because if you keep saying, I'm going to fail, then check it out. Before long, failure begins to knock. If you keep declaring that you are sick, before you know what's happening, sickness begins to knock on your door. If you keep saying, making negative prophecies over your children, over the, over the work of your hand, over whatever you are doing, before you know what's happening, those things begin to manifest. It is what with your mouth, it, with your mouth is what connects your, your faith, what you believe with the reality that you experience. And that's why the Bible tells us in verse number 13 of that Romans chapter 10. It says, for whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There has to be a declaration that comes out of your mouth for you to see the reality that you are looking for. We have to call with our mouth before we can be saved. We, which means you have to be able to open your mouth to determine what you get. If you stand before the Almighty God and refuse to speak, the Lord Almighty said, I will establish the fruit of the lips. Which means if nothing comes out of your mouth, nothing is going to be established. That is why what you say determines the reality that you, live, that, that you experience. And that is a high level overview of what we have read from Romans chapter 10 from, 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 from verse 1 all the way to verse number 13. Now, if we go back to that Romans chapter 10 again, which is the focus, the area I want to focus on this evening. Let's start reading from verse number 9. The Bible tells us in verse number 9, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The question that comes to mind is, why, why is there a need for me to confess with my mouth before I get saved? Why? Why do I have to come? Why is that confession necessary? What is the connection between the confession of my mouth and the things that I believe? Why? What is the connection? Why is the connection between the heart and the tongue necessary? Why is it important? Why is the declaration of my mouth important? Why do I have to make the confession before God does what he said he's going to do? Why? In our last installment, I went through a catalog of the reason why the word of your mouth is important. The first thing I want you to understand is that your declaration is important because it is a seed that you sow that will produce results. That's why it is important that you declare. It's a seed. The word of the mouth, the word that comes out of your mouth is a seed that the Lord Almighty works with. Number two, it is your, it, your, the word of your mouth is important because in the word they have life in them. And that is why I said earlier on, be careful what you say into your own life. Be careful what you say into the life of your children. Because you are declaring life. You are planting a seed and you are declaring life into that particular seed. Number three, the word of your mouth is important because you give angels command when you speak your word. The Bible tells us that he has, he said he makes his angels, he makes uh, the spirit uh, angels, uh, he gives his angels charge over his people. They are the ones who are going to continue to minister to the sons of salvation. They are ready at attention to hear the instruction that you are giving. And that is why it is very, very important that you don't speak ill about yourself so that you do not bring the anger and the judgment of God upon your life. So your mouth, the thing that comes out of your mouth, is extremely important. And not only that, the word that comes out of your mouth is important because it commits God to action. 
It commits God to action. When you look and you tell somebody, God says he's going to heal me. The word of God says he's going to heal me and I believe he's going to heal me. When you keep saying that, God knows that that is what he said. That no, God knows that that is what is written in the word of God. And God cannot lie. The Bible tells us that God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. Whatever he says he will do, he will do. When you declare the word of God with your mouth, you have committed God to action. That's why your word is very important. Okay? Those are the things that I told you in the last installment. This evening, I want to add one more reason why your mouth is very important. And that reason, I want you to look at it in the book of Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse number 23. The Bible tells us there, For assuredly I say to you, whosoever say to this mountain, be removed and be cast to the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says will be done, it will be, he will have whatever he says. Look at the connection there that we have been trying to establish. The connection between what you have, what you believe, and what you say. Jesus Christ said that if you make a declaration, you say to this mountain, you say to this situation, you say to this circumstances, be removed and be cast to the sea. He said, as long as you believe it in your heart, and you do not doubt. In other words, as long as your faith is surrounding that particular thing that you desire, he said, and you do not, I say, you will have what you say. Which means that it is not enough for you to have the faith in your heart. There has to be a declaration concerning that thing that you are believing, that thing that what has to be spoken out. When the word is spoken out, that is when it receives life. That is when the angels begin to act upon it. That is when the seed is being planted. That is when the Almighty God is committed. So please understand. The reason your word is important is because that word is a, the declaration of your mouth is important because that is the faith, that is the place that connects your word with the things that you believe of the Almighty God. Your word reveals your level of faith in the word of the living God. Because what you believe is what you declare. If you don't believe it, you will not declare. In other words, the declaration of our mouth is important because it tells us that we believe the instruction of scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 13 tells us, We have the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. We also believe, therefore we have spoken. If you, do not, if you don't believe, it will be difficult for you to speak about something. Because there will be no conviction behind it. There will be no assurance behind it. So you see, the words we speak reveal our faith or lack of faith in the living God. It tells us, it tells the whole world that we believe what God has said and what God has not said. You know? So you see, it is not enough for you to have the word of God in your heart. Please understand this. It is not enough for you to read the scriptures. It is not enough for you to sit under a teaching like this. It is not enough for you to surround yourself with the words of scripture. No. What is most important is that it is not, you know, it is not even enough to meditate on the word of God. What you must understand is that the word that you are reading, the word that you are hearing, the word that you are meditating upon, you must believe that word for it to be able to produce results. Because if you don't believe it, it's useless. And that's why there are so many people who are writing about the scriptures. A lot of people who are teaching about the word of God and there are no results. There are no, there are no, nothing, the, 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 the results that back up the word of God is not evident in their lives. Because it is one thing for you to read the word. It's another thing for you to believe the word. And only what you believe, that is what your mouth will be able to declare with conviction. Okay? So what you say is directly proportional to the level of your faith. Therefore, if your mouth is going to speak the word of encouragement, if your mouth is going to speak the word of healing and deliverance, your heart must believe that word of healing, that word of deliverance, that word of encouragement for it to begin to have effect. That's why the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 9, verse 29, it says, be unto you according to your faith. Be it unto you according to your faith. What you believe is what you are going to get. So you see, to control what comes out of your mouth, to control the words that you are speaking, 
to be able to speak the word that will elevate, the word that will bless, the word that will turn lives around. You must carefully feed your heart with the word of God. But most importantly, you must believe the word that you are feeding your heart. You must believe those words. Because if you don't believe those words, it's like just eating shaft. It makes no difference in your life. Okay? And the question now becomes, how do you now develop the faith that will control what comes out of your mouth? Because we say you have to read the word. You have to believe the word. How do you believe the word? How do you develop the faith to be able to control the things that come out of your mouth? Look at Romans chapter 10 verse 17. The Bible says that so then, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Very simple strategy that the Lord has put in his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the first step to be able to develop a faith that will control and tame our tongue is to listen and hear the word of God, which means expose yourself to the word of God, which means feed on the word of God, which means meditate on the word of God and surround yourself with the word of God. That is why the Bible tells us when Joshua was about to cross into the promised land, the Bible says, this book of the Lord shall not depart from your mouth, but you are meditating on it during day and night. And that thou may, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for, there, for, that, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and have good success. In other word, feed on the word. Meditate on the word. Practice the word. Make sure you do what the word is saying. Surround yourself with the word of God. See, that is the first step to building faith because faith comes by hearing. Okay? Many of us understand this particular part. Many of us have practices. We are in church. We have read the word of God. We read it at night. We read it in the morning. We try to surround ourselves with the word of God. We understand that first part. But you will notice that that word of God is not just one in that verse of the scripture. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, which is the first part, and hearing the word of God. There is a second part of that particular verse of the scripture that many of us don't pay attention to. The second part, Paul is, here, you know, is talking about understanding the word of God that you are reading. Okay? Understanding the word of God that you are reading. The Bible is saying we develop faith. When we, uh, that controls the word that comes out of our mouth. When we first of all hear the word of God. And then number two, when we understand what the word of God is saying. A lot of us read the scriptures. But we really don't understand what the Lord is saying. Until you understand what God is saying. Faith is not generated. Faith is not developed. Until you understand what the word of God is saying, your faith is not activated and faith is not inspired. When we talk about understanding, we're talking about seeing the word the way God sees it. I don't know whether it's ever happened to you, but there are times when somebody's trying to explain something to you. That person keeps telling you and the thing is just flying over your head, flying over your head. All of a sudden, it says a particular word or uses a particular illustration and the wires connect. All of, all, all of a sudden, the light bulb comes on. And they say, oh, I see. As soon as you say, I see, the whole point of what that person is saying becomes clear to you. You now understand exactly what that person is trying to do. You understand exactly where they are going. You understand the instruction that you are given. You understand what you must do. Because you now have an understanding. An illumination has come upon you. You know, you can see until you see what the word of God is saying to you. You cannot exercise it until you come to a place where you have an illumination. When the word of God is illuminated in your heart, when the word of God comes alive in your heart, until you get to that point, the word of God becomes very difficult. You cannot practice it. You cannot believe it. You cannot act upon it. So you see, my brothers and sisters, faith comes by hearing, but it comes also by understanding what you are hearing. Look at the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. If you start reading from verse number 30, the Bible tells us there. It says, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I understand unless somebody guides me? And Philip asked him to come and he asked Philip to come and sit with him. This is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. The Bible says that he has just come, he's coming back from Jerusalem. Heading back to his own country. And he was reading the book of Isaiah. He started reading about the fact that when Jesus was being tortured and when Jesus was going to die. And the Bible now tells us that when Philip got near him, Philip asked him, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand what you're saying? What you're reading? He said, I don't understand. 
Who is this guy? Is he talking about himself or talking about somebody else? Philip sat down, took the word of God, began to expound it to this particular Ethiopian eunuch. And when he understood it, Bible makes us to understand that as soon as the word of God came to him, as soon as the understanding came, light broke out in his heart. He understood what the prescriptor was saying. And the result of his understanding, the man knew what he was supposed to do. He knew that there was a requirement for what that is for what that scripture was talking about. He knew there was a requirement because he understood it. He was willing to give himself and submit himself to water to, to, to baptism. He accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and submitted himself to water baptism. The point I'm trying to make here is this: if Philip was not there to provide an understanding for him concerning what he was reading, he will read the scriptures from now to kingdom come. They will have no idea what is reading. And that is what is happening in the church. A lot of people read the scriptures. A lot of people have Bible study groups. A lot of people say they, they have all sorts of books that have been written. All sorts of materials that have been written. But we are reading the word of God. But we don't understand what the word of God is saying. And because we don't understand what the word of God is saying. The power of the word is not revealed in our lives. The power of the word of God is not made manifest. When the Ethiopian eunuch understood what the word of God was saying, the response was instant. Delivery, salvation became the order of the day because he knew what it meant. He had that connection when the understanding came. It is not enough for you to expose yourself to the word of God. It is not enough for you to read the word of God. You must first understand what the word of God is saying. Then believe that particular word that you have exposed yourself for before you can now begin to make a declaration. And so to control what comes out of your mouth, to be able to tame your tongue, to declare the glory of the almighty God, faith must well up in your spirit for you to be able to declare. Because it is when you believe in your heart. The word of God that you have received, that you have believed, that is the word of God that you are able to release out of your, out of your mouth. But if you do not believe it, if you do not, if you don't, if you don't receive the word, if you don't understand the word, if, if you believe in it, it becomes very, very difficult. Not only that, how do you develop faith? You develop faith also by having what is called a high level spiritual investment. High level spiritual investment. Look at the book of Proverbs 23, 23. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. In other words, you need to be able to make a high level investment in your spiritual development through fasting, through prayer, through self-restraint for you to be able to develop your faith. You need to be able to take the risk of stepping out of your comfort zone for your faith to be developed. You need to be able to say the word even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it's going to expose you to ridicule. You need to be able to get to the point where you forget about yourself and put yourself out there for the world to be able to make just of in case what you're saying does not work. That's what the three Hebrew children did. The Bible says that there was a statue. The king said you don't get into that but you don't bow to that statue. You're going to end up in the, in the, in the, in the, in the furnace. This, boy, this guy said, well, we are not going to bow down because we know our God will deliver. And even if our God does not deliver, we are still not bound down. That is a high level spiritual investment. You are declaring and you are telling the whole world, this is where I stand. Even if God doesn't come true, it doesn't change my mind. Until you get to that level, you find that, that faith is not fully developed. And declaring your word, the word that comes out of your mouth will not carry the true effect of what a child of God should be saying. And so your mouth is controlled by the things that you believe. Your mouth is controlled by the things that you believe. What you believe will find a way out of your mouth. But for it to find a way out of your mouth, you must first of all understand the word of God. Because without understanding, faith cannot be developed. Without faith, you cannot declare the glory of the Almighty God in this particular perverse generation. Before we close this very evening, I want to remind us of how we started. James chapter 3, verse, from verse number 7, we said, For every kind of beast and bird, of, uh, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, is tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no man has been able to tame the tongue. It is unruly and full of deadly poison. And the reason is because everyone has tried to do it in their own power. They've tried to do it in their own ability. 
They try to do it through self-discipline. But the Bible makes us to understand that as long as we try, say our righteousness is like the filter wrap before the Almighty God. As long as we're depending upon our own ability, we are going to continue to fail. But when we feed our soul with the Word of God, and we take time to understand what the Word of God is saying, and we now believe the Word of God as a result of our understanding, Taming the tongue becomes very easy because the Bible makes us to understand that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But that is when the heart has understood the word of God. That is when the heart has believed the word of God. That is when the heart has stored up the word of God. And so because of the abundance of the word of God that has been believed, faith is developed and the mouth begins to speak. The question this evening is that are you willing to make that spiritual investment in yourself? Are you willing to take time, not just to read the word, but to understand the word? Are you willing to take time to be able to allow the spirit of God to bring light onto that particular word so that faith will develop and then that faith will prompt you to speak according to the living of the Almighty? Are you willing to make that investment? Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God this evening.